All right? So that's what we are going to do. So let's just pray, and then we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, as we study your word, that you will just open it up to us. Thank you, Lord, that we can look at this practical session of um, biblical interpretation, that we could learn principles, and we know that it's so important, Lord, for us to get to the real meaning of what the text says. And as we do this session to illustrate how to do that and get some background on 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15, that you will just guide us and lead us and that we'll just grasp the principles involved, Lord, in all of this. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at the first thing. Who was Timothy? You know, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. It's entitled Timothy. So the question, obviously, that we need to ask is, who was Timothy? What role did he play? So I'm going to go through this quite fast because there's a lot of information to share. But what we do know about Timothy is that he was the child of a mixed marriage. His mom was Jewish. His father was Greek. And we know that because the scripture tells us that. Now, according to the strict religious observant Jews, people like that who was half Jewish, half Greek, were considered as bastards. All right? They weren't on the top of the line in terms of importance. And so um, Timothy used to travel with Paul and he traveled with Paul to various of the towns that Paul went on on his missionary journeys. All right. We know that he converted probably on Paul's first visit to Lystra. Lystra, Lystra, depends how you want to pronounce that. And then he comes into play the second time when Paul visits that, that village, you begin to read about and see about Timothy. All right, so he and Paul uh, became very close companions. He received a spiritual gift by the laying on of hands by the elders. We know that because the Bible tells us that. We also know that he traveled with Paul on his journeys through Phrygia, Galatia, Philippi, Berea, etc. He followed Paul to Athens. Um, various places. I'm not going to go into detail. Is there's indications in the book of Hebrews that he was with Paul in prison at some stage. So Paul and Timothy had a close relationship. He was a confidant of Paul. They were very, very close. And Paul mentored or he discipled Timothy. So what we can see is if you study all the places that they went to, and you really go and read up on the scriptures, they must have had a very, very good relationship. And it's to this disciple that Paul writes this letter, someone that he trusted, someone that he valued, and someone that he left in Ephesus. He took Timothy to Ephesus and he left him there and he said, listen, Timothy, I want you, you've got the experience, you've been with me for a long time, I want you to take care of the church in Ephesus. Young church, upcoming church, not, you know, hasn't existed for many, many years. And he says, I want you to take care of this church. It's a big step for, for Timothy to take up this shepherd role in this tremendous pagan city that Paul left him in. And to help him, Paul wrote this letter to give him basic guidance on how to deal with some of the major issues that he will be experiencing or that he was experiencing as the shepherd of this church. All right, so we can see, determine if we look at Timothy, very, very good relationship between him and Paul. Now, let's look at the city of Ephesus, obviously, because that's the context in which they wrote it. City of Ephesus, very, very interesting place. There's a map of that. Um, it's a very great and famous city in the Roman province of Asia. And it was um, opposite Samos, one of the little islands that's there. And it stood on sloping hills. Beautiful view from Ephesus. If you go there, you can go and visit it today. A beautiful view. The land around it was very fertile, exceptionally fertile. So very well, you know, with, uh, with crops and with farming and all of that. And a lot of people traveled there because Ephesus was very well situated. All right. It was one of the most accessible cities in Asia Minor. And it was very accessible by road and very accessible from the ocean. You could come, go there with a ship and you could. So because of that, there was a lot of trade taking place in the city. Very wealthy city, very rich city. A lot of people coming to visit Ephesus on a very regular basis. And that's why we see Paul went through Ephesus. In the time of the, of the Romans, it bore the name of the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. 
very, very famous place. Do you see that big theater that's there? That theater could hold up to 50,000 people, open air theater. You know what they came to watch there? Animals fighting with men and animals fighting with animals and people would be slaughtered and you know, see who would survive, etc. So people would flock to Ephesus to come and look at the games that was there or the games that took place there. Very famous, you can go and visit it today. 50,000 people, open air theater, a typical Roman style, how they built it. We also know that the Jews were established there in considerable numbers. Now, if you read the Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote in his writings, his volumes, Antiquities of the Jews, he wrote in book uh, 14, chapter 10, verse 11, he spoke about this whole thing in Antiquities of the Jews, of the Jews that were present in Ephesus. And we also know from Scripture, there were a lot of Jews that lived in Ephesus. And it's very interesting. Often you find, although Paul was called to the Gentiles, what would he do? Very often, if he goes into a city, he would first go to the synagogue. He would go and speak there, and then you'll proclaim to the Gentiles the message because he was the apostle called to the Gentiles. And that's why he went to Ephesus, this Gentile city. All right? Now, the biggest thing that Ephesus was known for was not so much the theater and the games, but a temple. And in Ephesus stood the temple of Diana, or also known as Artemis. Now how it works is the Roman name was Diana, the Greek name was Artemis. Very, very famous goddess. And people in huge numbers flocked to Ephesus to go and worship Diana. We can see that in, it's mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 19, 24. You can go and read about that. Now, what's interesting about this is that she was worshipped among the heathen nations under various modifications. She was identified as Sibel, or Sibel, depending on how you want to pronounce it, of the Phrygians. In Cappadocia, she was known as Ma. The Syrians, Atagaitis and Melita. What's interesting, among the Phoenicians, she was known as Astarte, and among the Assyrians as Ishtar. Now, if you go and look at the temple, a magnificent temple, 100, almost 104 meters long, 50 meters wide. The, the um, uh, columns stood almost 17 meters high. In fact, if you go and study the temple of Artemis, you will find that it was known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. One of the seven wonders. It was unparalleled in its beauty, <clears throat> in its construction, and how it was put together. And it was actually founded in the year 580 BC. And then what happened later on, it was destroyed with a fire. And then under the time of Alexander the Great, it was rebuilt. And the second temple of Artemis is what we read about in the book of Acts. All right, so it was rebuilt after a fire. And this is where a lot of the pilgrims went to. Now, the temple was very wealthy. Do you know that they owned a lot of land, a lot of farmland? In fact, they ran the fisheries. The wealthy would come and they would store their wealth there. In fact, a sacred museum of masterpieces and sculptures existed in there. And at the center, by the, uh, behind the curtains, hidden by curtains, was the shrine. They believed it fell from heaven. You know, the wooden part of it, it fell from heaven. And people came all over to worship Artemis of the Ephesians. There were a lot of artisans. In other words, people who carved little images of Diana, of Artemis, and they would sell it. So around the temple area, there were all these tradesmen, and they were carving and selling it to all the various um, groups of people, etc. And that also that no blood sacrifices were allowed there. Very regularly, there were games to honor Diana. And we're going to look now who was Artemis and Diana. All right, they, they had games to honor her. And also, interesting, if you were within, within the distance of an, a bow and arrow that you can shoot it, within that distance around the city walls of, or the temple walls, you were not allowed to be persecuted. There was a, a place of immunity. 
which means that a lot of criminals, a lot of people that were wanted and what should have been prosecuted came and they lived there. In fact, a little town developed close to that because there were so many people who were wanted by the law, but they can't be persecuted or prosecuted there um, because it's an indemnified area. You get immunity, if I can put it like that. And so you had a lot of criminals that came to live there. And they, um, they were trading there, etc., because, you know, they were safe. And you had the merchants, and you had the priests, and you had all of these people that were living there. All right? So I almost want to say, because of all the wealth that was stored there, kings brought their wealth. The wealthy brought their wealth. It was almost like the Bank of England is considered today as a safe place of investment. I don't know how much longer. But the Bank of England, this was what... The temple of Artemis was like, all right? So extremely wealthy, very, very wealthy. Okay, now the question is, who was Diana? Who was Artemis? There's some photos. Diana sim symbolized the generative and nutritional powers of nature. She was the goddess of reproduction, a sex goddess. That's why you see her depicted with many breasts. And how it worked was that she had a chief priest, the man who was a chief priest, and he was normally, that position was held by a eunuch. And there were other priests. By the way, the, the chief priests, very interesting when I look at the name, Megabezos. It's the name of the chief priest. Okay? <laughs> Any case. And under him there were other priests known as the Essenes or the Essens. And so they would operate in the temple area, but under them were a lot of priestesses. And the interesting thing is, they were so many that they were known as Melissae. Now what is that? It's a bee. Because if you would come to the temple area, there were so many temple priestesses there. It was almost like bees. And that's why if you look at coins and archaeological digs of that time period, you'll find that many of the coins have got a bee on it. Because it symbolizes the priestesses that worked at the temple of Artemis. Many of them. All right. And we know that there were three classes of them. One of the class were virgins. And then the others participated in the ritual temple ceremony of temple prostitution. Because Diana, Artemis, was a goddess of sexuality, sex goddess, reproduction, etc., people would come from all over, and the men, in order to bring honor to Artemis, would have intercourse with the priestesses. The act of intercourse brought glory and honor to Diana. And it's in this context that Timothy found himself and it's in this context that Timothy had to kind of look at this um, the thing. How am I going to manage the church? How am I going to run the church? And Paul knew about all these challenges that was taking place. So it's almost like people came from all over, not just to partake in pagan worship, but to partake in the actions of how the worship is done. And you had these little bees everywhere taking men in, they led the services, they led the men into that whole process of bringing honor to Artemis or Diana, etc. And that gives you a bit of idea of the, of the, of the context. All right? These women were very often adorned with gold. Remember, the temple area was very, very wealthy. Expensive clothes, gold, pearls, earrings, Everywhere they were braided hair and plaited hair and, you know, different kind of hairstyles, etc. Very seductive in nature, the way that they dressed. Very seductive, you can think, you know, because what did they want to do? To seduce the men into bringing honor to Diana, etc. They didn't exercise self-control. A lot of immorality that took place there, a lot of fornication, etc. All right. So that's kind of the context. And here is Timothy, a young man who needs to run a church and manage a church in this context. And Paul writes to him to counter this extreme pagan culture in which he finds himself. Now, let's read this passage again and let's look 
Now that you know the background, and then we're going to look at some of the verses and try to explain it. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adore themselves in respectful apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly attire. So can you see why he's writing this? All right. He says, but with what is proper for women to profess godliness with good works. So in other words, it's not the outward appearance. It's the quality of your character. Do what is right. Do good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. All right. Context. Because who led the temple worship? The woman led the temple worship. All right. In Artemis. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. Now, pagan worship, Artemis, small Christian community, and that's where... Timothy found himself. Okay. What Paul is doing is he's giving Timothy guidelines on how to manage a congregation in an extreme pagan culture. And what he's actually doing is he is removing all the elements that can associate the church with the worship of Artemis. He says to the woman, listen, I don't want you to dress the way that these women are dressing. Because you know why? People are traveling from all over to come and worship Artemis. And if they come and they see, oh, here's a gathering, they might think, this is a little gathering to bring honor to Artemis. We're going to find sexual immorality here. We're going to. And so when they look at you, they must see from the outstart, from the beginning that, listen, these women are not the same as the temple prostitutes. These are not the busy bees that's going to entertain us and that's going to help us with it. These women look differently. They're not wearing braided hair and they're not in gold and they're totally different. So Paul wants a separation between the world and the church. He doesn't want anyone to think that there's a connection between the worship of Artemis and the worship of Jesus. Very clear distinction that he wants. And that's why he's so strict on the woman. Because he is countering the culture and the setting in which Timothy found himself in that moment in time. Alright? So, let's look at the verses. And I'm quickly going to go through that and give some explanation. Number 8, or verse 8 says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray lifting holy hands without anger and without quarreling. Now what is very interesting, Paul is actually referencing an Old Testament scripture here. And he's referencing Malachi chapter 1 and Malachi 1 verse 14, which deals with the fact that um, he, when you come together to pray, see that there's no quarreling, etc. You know, fix things up before you do that. Okay? And so the church, in Paul's view, the church in Paul's view in Ephesus is fulfilling the prophetic promise that the church's prayers become a sign of the fullness of God's promise to offer salvation to the nations. The church becomes the vehicle through which it is done. So Paul wants a distinction between paganism and the church. So Paul knew that the kingdom of God is going to be established through a group of people that is set apart. And he quotes from Malachi, not directly, but he references Malachi 1. He goes on, verse 9, 10, and 11, and he says, Likewise, also that women should adore themselves with respectable apparel, with modesty, self-control, with no braided hair and gold, pearls, or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. All right? In other words, don't be like the temple prostitutes. Don't dress like them. Don't talk like them. Don't take the lead with them. Take a back seat when it comes to this. All right? Because I don't want people to confuse the church and the temple worship of Diana. Now, Paul is not saying that women can never participate in church ministry. How do we know that? Because in other parts of his writing, he commends women that's involved in church ministry. All right? 
He is not cancelling uh, women out from being involved and speaking and doing that because in other places he actually praised them and I'll give you some examples of that to do that. So this is not a can cancellation. This is countering the culture in order to have the church stay distinct and unique. Now if you look at roles, the role of women and men are different. Their spiritual positions and functions are complementary but it's not the same and it's important to understand this all right because there's a lot of confusion these days about this it is not a competition what we need to understand is that man rules by position a woman rules through influence <laughs> Brett has got a lot of experience in that all right that's why men love titles. I'm the CEO, I'm the director, I'm the manager. Men rule by positions. Women rule through influence. That's why if you get home, husbands, you know, and your wife just looks at you, and you know something is wrong, there's trouble. They don't have to say a word. You just know. All right? And that's why if you look at the role of the church, what's the role of the, of the bride of Christ? It's to influence the world into the worship of Jesus Christ. We hear as an influence, the bride of Christ. It's the same with a woman. A wife's role is to influence her husband more and more into the purposes and the will of God. And the husband's role is to lead the family. That's why the priest of the home, the concept, the whole time of head of the home, etc. And if the two works together, it forms a beautiful unity. It's got nothing to do with importance. It's got to do with role. If you take a husband or a man and you try to enforce a woman's role on him and he must suddenly do that, things go terribly wrong. Believe me. All right? When we make authority a leadership status or an issue, it seems wrong that women can't apply for the same job. So if authority or leadership is like a status issue, women can say, but, but I want to have the same status in society. And that's what the fight has been all about. In the church, we need to understand something. Biblically, authority and leadership in the church is not a status issue. It's a function issue. There's a big difference. There's competition in the church because we don't understand it correctly when it comes to this whole thing of what leadership is. And Jesus deals with it in John 13 because he goes and he washes the feet of his disciples. And he said, if you want to be great in the kingdom, the principle is you have to do what? You have to serve. You have to fulfill your function. What's your function? To serve. To wash feet. And Jesus says, if you don't do this, you have no part of me. When John and James, when his mother came and said, Lord, let my one son sit at my left hand side, one in the right in your kingdom. Jesus says, these positions are not for me to give, but for to my father will give it for those that has been destined to give. He says, but learn this. Whoever wants to become great among you must be the servant. All right? Very important to understand that we've got a misunderstanding of authority and leadership in the church. Leadership in the church is servanthood. It's leading, serving other people to greatness. It's not position. It's not status. And if you see it like that, the roles of women and men becomes clearer because there's no competition in that. And this passage of scripture in Timothy has been used for a long time to subdue women. That's not what Paul is doing. He's dealing with a cultural issue. Now, if you look at women in church, I've got two minutes to finish. If you look at women, the Bible is clear that women engaged in evangelism. Lydia Chloe was mentioned in terms of evangelism. Judea and Syntyche worked alongside the Apostle Paul. These were women. So Paul is not saying they can't engage in ministry because that contradicts the rest of his writings and his lifestyle. All right? L women engage in teaching. Aquila and Priscilla. Do you know that Aquila and Priscilla is mentioned? They were put out of Rome, you know, and they came and they ministered with Paul. Do you know when it's referred to, Pris to Aquila and Priscilla in terms of their giftings and their role of teaching? Priscilla is mentioned first every time which is contrary the culture it's always men first then the second it's Aquila and Priscilla but when they addressed in terms of their ministry work were they teaching 
Priscilla is mentioned first, which shows, and Luke did this deliberately, many scholars believe it's because she was the primary teacher. Look at the next one, for example. They engage in prophesying. Miriam, Deborah prophesied. Luke presents Anna as a woman prophet in Luke 2.36. Philip's four daughters are mentioned in the Bible who had the gift of prophecy, Acts chapter 21. They engage in apostleship in Romans Paul almost greets as many women as he meets or as he greets men in his letter to the Romans. And he refers to the women as his ministry colleagues or his co-workers. Alright, so Paul is definitely not putting them down in that context. So women in the church are not restricted um, from public playing or prophesying. 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible nowhere restricts women from exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Women, just as men, are called to minister to others, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, and to proclaim the gospel to the lost, Matthew 28. Women are encouraged to teach other women, Titus 2, all right? And they need to teach the children. In time, this is the city of Ephesus. Let's jump back to the context here. In time, the pilgrims, with decreasing faith in Diana, Artemis, came in fewer numbers. The sails of the shrines of the goddess fell off. Diana of the Ephesians was no longer great. A Christian church was grounded there and flourished. Finally, in the year 262 AD, when the temple of Diana was burned for a second time, its influence had so far departed that it was never again rebuilt. Ephesus had a strong Christian presence and in the year 341 AD, a council of the Christian churches were held there. Can you see how this little guidance that Paul gave Timothy caused the church to grow and their faithfulness and their prayer and seeking the Lord? So much so that the worship of the one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple area and what they came to do, diminish, 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 diminish. So think about this thing, and I'll close with this thought. What are the cultural things today that we need to stand against? That if Paul had to write this letter to us today, he would say, be careful for this and this and this. What are the things in our culture that makes the church appears to be one with the world? What are the things in our culture, when unbelievers look at us, they say, but we can't see a difference between Christians and the world. We can't see a difference between Artemis worship and the worship of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. It's the same thing. Paul said, no, no, there must be a radical difference. What are those differences in our generation? Think about that. Because that is our hermeneutical application today. Now we know what it said. The thing is, how do we apply it? Think about that. All right. Can you see how knowing the context changes things and makes it clearer? All right, let's pray.